Hi folks, I wonder have you seen the video of Stephen Fry, the British comedy actor, being interviewed on the Irish television programme The Meaning of Life? You can find a segment from this on YouTube. I'll feature it down below in the, in the uh, description. So you should probably go watch that now, it's only about a minute long. Watch that now and come back. Just in case you didn't do that, uh, I'll explain a little bit about it. Um, the host, Gay Byrne, the host of the program, asks Stephen Fry the typical question that I have been asked many times by Christians. What if you're wrong? What if you end up standing at the pearly gates and you're faced with God? What are you going to say to him? And Stephen Fry basically gives God a piece of his mind and shows God out to be the monster that he is in Stephen Fry's way of looking at it. When I first watched this video, I was thinking, yes, you know, good for you, good for you um, for saying these things. But then I asked myself, um, if I were a Christian, because I used to be one, so I know how Christians think, I know intimately how they think, would Stephen Fry's words here have convinced me, have made me abandon my faith? No. Why not? Because the Christian does not believe that God is responsible for all the bad things in the world. One of the examples that Stephen Fry used was insects that live inside a child's eye and eat their way out from the inside. Why would God make a thing like that? The Christian answer is that he didn't make it like that. The universe is fallen. Creation is fallen. And it's fallen because of us. There was an event in the distant past that if you're sensible, you don't take literally. I'm talking about the Garden of Eden account of the serpent tempting Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is a symbolic story, a metaphor, if you like, of something that happened, something that happened in the distant past, something that was our fault, that plunged the world into the state that it is in today. This is our doing, not God's. The world is the way it is because of us. So that's how I would have maintained my faith. You see, the Christian looks upon God from a position of humility. He is the creator. You're the creature. You're just dust. And you have offended the Creator. And you deserve his wrath. But in his mercy, he has chosen to forgive you. So you see how that relationship is very different from a person standing boldly and proudly and condemning God. That, that's why, I'm not saying that's what I believe now. I don't believe that now. I don't believe creation is fallen. I have a vastly different view on it than I used to have. Um, we won't get into why I, what I think and why I think it in this video, because I would talk your ear off for too long. But I'm just explaining why a speech like Stephen Fry's is ineffective. You're not really getting to the heart of things. You're not understanding the Christian position and refuting it from that basis. You're just kind of chipping away at the outside and it's not gonna work. This it really becomes, in that sense, it really becomes just a piece of mutual atheist backslapping. Well done, comrade. We, get, we congratulate each other and Religion just keeps on going. Um, so that's my observation on that. But the more interesting part of that show, 
uh, is a part that you don't see in the common YouTube clips. I came across it in, um, uh, what do you call the guy? Russell Brand, The Trues. He featured a couple of clips from the program. And uh, he featured a clip where the host said to Stephen Fry, what about spirituality without religion? And I can't remember exactly what Stephen Fry said, but he poo-pooed the whole idea of that and mentioned uh, if people want to grab a crystal, well then I suppose they want they can do that if they want. So he basically used the most crass New Agey example of spirituality that he could think of, and he totally threw the baby out with the bathwater. Now I'm drawing attention to this because. This is essentially the battle that I am fighting. I'm fighting a battle here on two fronts. I am trying to dismantle organized religion, Christianity specifically. You know I have that particular agenda if you've watched my videos. I am anti-Christian. I believe it's objectively wrong. I believe it's damaging. And I speak to that effect. But I also believe that the opposite of Christianity, which is a very materialistic form of atheism, the most common form of atheism, that is equally damaging for different reasons. So I want to get into that a little bit here, just with what I think is the best way to sort of find the middle ground that I have found, or at least to sort of work your way gradually towards the middle ground that I have found. So here's how I would go, go about this. When you make a rejection of religion, you make this big paradigm shift to this other way of looking at life. Before you had the idea of God, now there is no God. You had a sense of spirituality, now you have no spirituality. A sense of the supernatural, now there's no supernatural. So there's a huge big paradigm shift towards what's called naturalism and materialism, where the only thing that is real is what is tangible, what you can see and touch. But I maintain that that's the wrong way of looking at life. It should be obvious why that could lead to depression, because it is a very, it's a way of life that renders life essentially accidental and meaningless uh, because there is no sense of anything transcending this. But here's why, here's why it's wrong. If you consider the predicament of a goldfish in a bowl, you can see that the goldfish has very obvious limits on its ability to know reality. Now let's define reality as the sum total of everything that is real, both seen and unseen. For the goldfish, its ability to access reality is hindered by the edge of the goldfish bowl. It can see a little bit beyond that, and that's as far as it goes. A goldfish cannot know anything about stars and planets, about supernovas, about black holes, about spiral galaxies, about curved space-time, right? The goldfish cannot know about any of these things because it can't perceive very far, nor can it think very far because of its very tiny brain, okay? So then we have us, we have human beings. And for some reason, we indulge in this thought that we don't have any limits on our ability to perceive reality. We think that what we are able to see and detect is the sum total of reality. So we end up living our lives in a sense of existential crisis because we think it's just this. It's just this and nothing more. It's just us. It's just here and now. It's just what I see, what I feel. 
Why would it be like that for us when it's not like that for the goldfish? Now let's remember that the human and the goldfish are cousins of one another, evolutionarily speaking. We both have eyes, we both have a mouth, we both have a, an intestinal tract that takes energy in one end and shoots it out the other. We are essentially the same thing, evolved in different directions. So the same constraints to one extent or another have to apply to the, both the goldfish and the human being. So it stands to reason that we're only able to perceive so far and to think so far. And we, you know, the real clue to the fact that we have a limit on how far we can see and how far we can think and how much we can know. The clue is in the fact that we know we're in this big mystery. We have no clue why there is a universe of time and space at all. Why does a singularity unfurl itself as space-time. Why does that happen? That is a profoundly weird thing that nobody has the answer to. And we know we're not going to get the answer because if you think of the universe happening in reverse and you see yourself and the universe shrinking down into that singularity and disappearing, space-time itself disappearing into, how shall I describe it? A state of infinite density and zero volume that's incomprehensible to the mind and yet that is the origin of everything we are only scratching the surface of reality and when you live with a sense that there is more than just what you see spirituality is as good a name for that as any. Doesn't mean you necessarily believe in an afterlife. Doesn't mean you necessarily believe in God as a being. A being like us with whom we can communicate. All my ideas about God are completely abstract. They have to be because I cannot know what God is. And it gets really interesting when you start to have confidence in the notion that nobody else does either. When you've read enough books and thought about it hard enough and you realize that everybody who claims to know what God is, claims to represent God, claims to communicate what God is thinking, these are all frauds. <laughs> so... My position is just to relax into the mystery and to trust it because I have no reason not to. I don't need someone to tell me that my soul will survive death. I have very different ideas about that. I don't need these falsely comforting words. I just need to trust in the mystery. To live my life with a sense that uh, my life is a part of a whole that is incomprehensible and yet meaningful. Don't have to understand it. Can't understand it. That's a very... you live When you think about life like that, notice how that's a kind of spirituality that is not authoritarian in nature whatsoever. It's purely reasoned. It doesn't require me to look at a particular religious text and to allow it to become an authority in my life where I obey it without question, like the Bible or the Quran or whatever. I just reason this. And this, this middle ground between atheism and religion is 
somewhere along the lines of where the truth lies. Understanding that authoritarian religion is a big con. People who claim to represent God are conning you. And yet at the same time, there is something. There is something beyond all this. You just can't quite put your finger on it. But if you live with a sense that it's there, that's far better than living with a sense that all there is is just what you can see and feel and touch. <laughs>